Our scriptures for today are found in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and from the book of Job and from Numbers 12. Hear the word of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I will read from uh, Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 instead. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Tell the people of Israel, I am sent me to you. And to Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 to 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. We thank you, Lord, for this reading of your holy word. Amen. Please be seated. We had an, an election not very long ago, just a week or so ago. And in America, we have elections, and we're very thankful for them. Because we can challenge our leaders, and we can put them, hopefully put them in their places. When politicians get out, out of order, we can remember Watergate. And uh, you might remember that's the time that President Nixon was impeached and forced to resign the presidency. And then there was Clintongate in which the president was found guilty of perjury and abuse of power, and he was impeached. At election time, we're used to hearing, throw the bums out. And we say to politicians, I voted you into office, and I can vote you out of office. And think about this. Can we say such things about God? Can we bring God down? Or can we vote him out? Well, there were communist dictators, Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin, and they thought that they could bring God down. They made atheism the official religion of Russia, and they committed themselves to the annihilation of Christianity in the Soviet Union. They closed all the churches and destroyed many of them. They ridiculed, they harassed, and executed religious leaders. They flooded the schools and the media with atheistic propaganda. And they promoted a new religion called scientific atheism. And every citizen was forced to accept. And those that didn't accept paid a price. Over 20 million Russians, Russian Christians, were killed as a result of these Soviet atheistic policies. And right up until the 1970s, Christians were put in prison and insane asylums because they said in this modern age belief in God is insanity. Today people all around the world, people around us, they say God if you exist I want you to do what I want you to do and if you don't I don't believe in you anymore. But can we wish God out of existence or do a popularity poll and, and uh, vote God out? Or can we destroy God by not believing in him? Not the God of the Bible. We didn't call God into existence, and we can't put God out of existence. Our Bible texts today proclaim that God's name is I Am. The first question is, why is there something and not nothing? Or as in the Sound of Music, she said, nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever could. And the answer, why is there something, is always goes back to God's name, I am. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the ultimate question is not, do you believe in God? But does God believe in you? And before this table, we see that God does believe in us. God's power is evident in nature. 
And his power is also seen in special revelation. So we are affected by our belief or not a non-belief in God. A skeptic once said to a Christian, you believe in God like some people believe in the Loch Ness Monster. When scientists go to Loch Ness with cameras, they find no evidence. Your God is, a, is irrelevant and unsearchable as the Loch Ness Monster. But the Christian replied, I don't live in Scotland, and I never sailed on Loch Ness, so whether Nessie exists or doesn't exist doesn't affect me. But every one of us lives on this earth, and we face every day life, and death. The existence of God does affect our thoughts and our actions. So whether we believe in God is of no concern. The important question is, does God care about us? And does God act to help us? And this meal before us answers that question. We are told Jesus is the great I am. Do you know over history people have been debating the existence of God? And out of all these centuries, there's been four theological arguments, or, or physiological, or philosophical arguments for God's existence. And uh, you can come up with, a, with, with one of them, but they all go into one of these four categories. And when I first reading these four <coughs> philosophical uh, thoughts for the evidence of God, I thought my, my brain was going to blow. I had to read, read it over and over and over again to try to understand it. So here's, here's the first one, and, and it comes from the 11th century with uh, St. Anselm. It's called the ontological argument for the existence of God. And St. Anselm says, God is something in which nothing greater can be conceived. Think of that. God is something in which nothing greater can be conceived. Logic tells us there is an end to perfection, and the end is God, the most perfect being that exists. And we can see his grandeur in, na in nature, and we can see his grandeur in man. God is the greatest conceivable being, greater than we can even imagine. Imagine that you created, maybe like the deacons, the greatest chocolate fudge sundae that ever existed. Well, it might be the greatest chocolate sundae, but you're greater than that sundae because you imagined it and you made it. Now look at the universe around us, and you can trace back the creation to the creator. He's greater than all his creation. The second argument for the existence of God is called the cosmological argument, or the first cause argument. Since this universe was caused, it's God who caused it and set it in motion. God is the original cause from which creation is, was created. The third argument is called the, the teleological argument, and it's called the argument from design. And if you look around us, the complexity of this universe and the complexity of this earth and how even the slightest thing changes, and all humanity is, is at risk. It's like how this world is so much so complicated, it's like a watch, and a watch is very complicated. And a watch demands a designer, somebody who can put these parts together in order to, to, to tell the time. And that's called the great, the intelligent designer who formed the heavens and the earth to prove the existence of God. Some people call, back in the days of the deists, they said he's the great watchmaker. God is the great watchmaker who made the heavens and the earth. And the last, the fourth argument, is called the moral argument. And they said, you study mankind all over the world, people that never had any contact with each other, and every culture has a standard of what is right and what is wrong. Every culture has its concept of God. Therefore, there must be a transcendent moral being who directs us to his morality, uh, and teaches us right from wrong. So these are the four, theolog er, four physiological arguments outside of, of the Bible and that point to the existence of God. But now let's go into the Bible and see how the book of Genesis proves the existence of God. The very opening words of the Bible declare, in the beginning, God created. And when Moses asked God his name, he said, I am 
who I am. In Colossians, Paul writes that Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So in the Bible, you'll find no pleading for anyone to believe in God. Instead, we're, we face very uh, vocal assertions. Before the beginning, God existed, and in his time, he made everything that is. And so our thoughts on the matter are unimportant because we weren't there, and he was. Have you ever tried to understand creation? To understand it, we need to understand our creator. And he put us here with a desire to know him. And he revealed himself to us in his word and in his living word, Jesus Christ. You know, even the best human proofs of God's existence are not enough. Because we can only know God from the inside of creation. And God stands outside of his creation. It's like an ant who believes that humans exist. And the ant can know humans are big and that they need to fear us because we could stomp on them and put them to death. Ants know that, that humans provide crumbs in which they can, can eat, so they show up at our every picnic. And they know that we can cast shadows over them uh, when we get in the way of the sun. But an ant can never understand what a human is unless a human could reach down to an ant level and explain it to them. On their own, ants can never understand what a human is except appearance. And that's a lot of people that don't know the Bible, that don't understand the Bible. They understand that, that uh, there, there's a God and you can fear him. The Apostle James writes, you believe that there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that. And they shudder. But we can go further than just fearing God. We, need, we have a desire within us to know God's love because God has put eternity in our hearts. We're God-shaped void, and that void desires to be loved by God. And John Calvin called that, that's the seed of the religion. The seed of true religion is that love which draws us to God. And we can know God because he has condescended to show himself to us. God did this to Moses when he spoke to Moses from a burning bush and from a pillar of cloud and, and from smoke. Jesus showed it to Thomas and his unbelief. He, he had invited Thomas to take your hands and put them in my nail wounds. But we can also know God by faith because the Holy, as the children said, the Holy Spirit has put Christ in our hearts, a desire to know and love him. And that's why we sing at communion. Hear, O Lord, I see thee face to face. Hear what I touch and handle things unseen. Hear grasp with firmer hand eternal grace. And all my weariness I lean upon thee. So the Holy Spirit draws us to truth. In the book of Jeremiah, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Atheists doubt the Bible, but in Romans 1 we read, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. We have all around us the existence, proof of the existence of God's power, and his love. So it makes more sense for God to say, I don't believe in atheists, than for atheists to say, I don't believe in God. Because the first means nothing. Whether we say we believe in God or not doesn't matter. But if God doesn't care for us, that makes a great deal of, deal of difference. But through this meal, we see how much God cares for us. The first thing we need to understand, though, is that God is eternal. He's separate from us, and he's outside of time and space. Even if you believe that this universe was created by a big bang, you're confronted with the question, well, who made the big bang? It must have come from somewhere. As Julie Andrews sang in that opening song, she said, perhaps I had a wicked childhood, perhaps I had a miserable youth, but somewhere in my wicked, miserable past, 
there must have been a moment of truth. For here you are standing there loving me, whether or not you should. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. Why? Because nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever could. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. And you know that's pretty terrible theology, if, if you look at it, because uh, uh, we can't do enough good to earn God's love. But she should have put in there about grace. God still loves us, even though we don't deserve to, to be loved. But it's true what she said. Nothing comes from nothing. Nothing ever could. Here's what the Bible declares. God has made everything beautiful in its time. And he's also set eternity in the human heart. And it's for this reason that Jesus Christ sealed for us eternity on the cross. R.C. Sproul said, The first words of the Bible are the most relevant and fundamental assertion of Christianity and the chief target of secular philosophers and neo-pagans. Why? Because if you succeed in getting rid of the idea that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, then you can be your own God and you can do whatever you want to do. And that's exactly what we're seeing all around us today. But Psalm 90 tells us, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth or the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you were God. And Isaiah 57 says, He is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. You know, there's a wonderful comfort and blessing to knowing that we have a creator. Whenever you feel hopeless or defenseless, focus on this scripture. This is There used to be these memory scriptures that we used to memorize and keep them close to our heart. Well, here's one of them. The eternal God is our dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Christ came to be our Savior King, so that we can reign with him forever and ever. We are told his kingdom shall never end, and we will delight in him forever. We are told God will never leave us, and he will never forsake us. Here's another memory verse from Lamentations chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new each morning. Great is your faithfulness. Many centuries later, an angel came to a virgin and said, You are to give him the name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Lastly, in 1 John chapter 4, we read, In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Let us have communion with the one true God. Now let us pray. Dear Lord, we give you thanks for communion, for you call us around this table and talk, talk to us of, of eternal things. We know that we live in a fallen world with tornadoes and crime and, and all, all sorts of uh, evil inclinations. But in spite of that, Lord, you still love us. And you sent your Son to earth to save us. Help us, Lord, as we receive the bread and the cup of communion to refresh our love for